Hey, what's up, everybody? It's Ned Bellavance, Ned1313 on Twitter, and welcome to the Daily Check-In for June 19th, 2020. Happy Juneteenth, everybody. I don't know if happy is the right word, but I'll say happy Juneteenth, and someone can correct me if that's not right. But I'm excited to know about this holiday, if, if we're being completely honest, because up until this year, I didn't know Juneteenth, Juneteenth was a thing, and that's that's a little surprising because apparently a lot of other people knew. So I feel kind of silly for not knowing that. And I feel a lot better that I know it now. And I think there's a lot of mostly white Americans that had no idea. And I'm glad that they do. I'm glad that that reality is sinking in and the uh, the awareness is catching up. So uh, that that's one thing I wanted to say. And, uh, and so uh, happy Juneteenth. And today's topic is HashiCorp Vault, because Fridays are now all about Vault. I'm going to be covering HashiCorp Vault and center it around the associate certification that's now available. So that's going to be my focus for Fridays, and I'm going to create a playlist for it and, and all that jazz. So if HashiCorp Vault is something that interests you, you should check it out. If it's not, maybe watch this video, because this video is purely about what Vault is and why you might use it. So that's what I'm going to be talking about in this episode. A few housekeeping items before that. Uh, number one, next week is HashiConf EU, which is obviously virtual and online, but it's going to be an absolutely great conference. I believe it's Tuesday and Wednesday. So if you have some availability and you want to check it out, go for it. If not, you know, because it's virtual, you can watch the sessions afterwards. But I know there's going to be some interesting announcements during it. I also am going to be part of a panel talking about certifications and HashiCorp. That's going to be live on Tuesday at 8.30 a.m. Eastern Time. I know that seems really early, but the event is actually running in Central European time, which is, it's like 2.30 there uh, in the afternoon and 8.30 in the morning for me. But I'm a morning person, so that's fine. Uh, so those are my housekeeping items. If you're interested, you know, check it out. I'll include links to uh, HashiConf in uh, the show notes. Before we get into the main topic, I just want to check in with you. How are you? How are things going? It's Friday. Friday is awesome. We made it through this entire crazy week together. And now hopefully we get to relax and recharge over the weekend. I know basically after I wrap this up, I have to do a podcast and then I'm heading to the shore and I'm spending the weekend at the shore and I'm going to try not to look at my computer at all. It's going to be hard, but I'm going to try to do it. And, and I hope that you have a chance to unplug and unwind as well. Now let's talk about HashiCorp Vault. Okay. So what is Vault? What is the point behind it? I think probably the easiest way is to make an analogy if you're already familiar with cloud tools. If you've ever used Azure Key Vault or AWS's uh, KMS service, those two are similar in nature to what Vault is meant to do. Vault is basically a secrets management solution. I call it a secrets lifecycle solution. And secrets are any sensitive data that you would not want stored in clear text and you would want to, you know, put a lot of protections around. So it's all about securing those credentials. And for that reason, Vault makes a lot of sense as a name. It's a completely open source product, which is nice, especially from a security standpoint. Security people can go in and review the contents of the open source and, you know, help help out if there's some gaps, but also just ensure that's a very secure product. It's cloud agnostic, you deploy it and manage it. So you don't have to worry about, oh, this works on Azure, but it doesn't work on AWS. And how do I get it into Google? It works wherever you deploy it. And you can also make it a publicly accessible endpoint. So you can, you know, install it in your data centers, and then access the secrets from one of the clouds, or you could do the inverse of that. So there's a lot of options there because it is self hosted. Now, what are the major components of Vault? Well, you basically have a compute front end that's running the Vault server service. And clients interact with that service through the API or the UI. So if you're an administrator or you're a developer and you just need to you know look at a GUI of some kind, there is a front end UI that can be optionally enabled. But most of the interaction with Vault happens either through the CLI 
or through the API by developers. So as an administrator, you might use the CLI a lot. As a developer, you would probably use the API a lot. And the CLI is actually just a skin of the API. So anything you can do in the CLI, you can do through the API. That's very important. So that hopefully gives you an idea of what the front end of Vault looks like. And on the back end, it uses some sort of storage back end. And it's not super concerned with how that storage is. I mean, the storage should be secure, but it's not super concerned about that storage because everything that gets written back to that storage is already encrypted before it hits the storage. Vault takes care of all of that. It stores all this stuff in memory and when it needs to pull a secret out of storage, it pulls it and decrypts it in memory and it lives in memory. And then when it needs to write data to the storage, it encrypts it before it sends it to that storage. So in that way, Vault is really, you know, sitting in the middle, it's providing the storage. What kind of storage can you use? Well, unsurprisingly, you can use console, which is Hashi, another product from HashiCorp as the storage backend for Vault. And I believe they've introduced their, uh, their own native storage as well. So there's a few options there. And then there's a bunch of other storage backends you can choose. So I, I don't want to get too deep into that. Now, how does it do everything in memory? What mechanism is it using? What it has is it has a set of encryption keys a master key, in fact, and that master key lives in storage, but that master key, unsurprisingly, is also sitting encrypted in that storage. So how does Vault get going if the master key is also encrypted? Well, it has an unseal key. The unseal key decrypts the master key, and then the master key is stored in memory, and then that master key can be used to decrypt the rest of the contents of what's in storage. Bearing that in mind, how do you assemble and where do you store that seal key? Well, the answer is you have multiple people have pieces of that seal key. And then those multiple people have to each input their portion of the key for it to kind of Voltron together into this seal slash unseal key that will then decrypt the master key and then Vault can get going and, and start serving up requests. There's a bit more to it than that, but that's the general idea. So when you think about how you would launch Vault Server, it's not a, a one person affair. You would have multiple people launching the Vault Server. And then, then that seal key is extremely important because that's sort of the keys to the castle, right? So that's two, two elements of it, uh, the seal key and the master key. Now, other things that are part of Vault, there's an authentication piece. So you can enable different authentication plugins that determine how someone gets a token from Vault. And tokens are the base authentication mechanism for basically everything in Vault. Once you have a token, that token codifies what you can do within Vault, what secrets you have access to, whether you can perform administrative functions, all of that is tied up in your token and you get a token through one of these other authentication plugins. And it's got plugins for stuff like LDAP. So if you have Active Directory or LDAP, you can snap into that. It also can use other authentication sources like Azure Active Directory or GitHub. So GitHub's probably one of the easiest ways to get started. And then it has what are called more machine-centric authentications like Apparel that allow a machine to rapidly get a token and then renew that token over time. Tokens do have a lifetime associated with them, and they can be renewed before that lifetime expires. It gets a little deeper than that, and we'll definitely cover that in a future episode. But so it, the important things to understand is you have to authenticate to Vault and get a token, and then you use that token to access secrets and perform other functions within Vault. The secrets are enabled through secrets engines. So just like you have your authentication plugins, you also have your secrets engines. And there's a whole bunch of different secrets engines out there for different things you would want secrets for. What are some good examples? Well, the basic one is the key value secret store. You basically create, you can have multiples of these. You create a key value secrets engine instance on a path, and then you can write different secrets values to that key value store using a key and a value. Pretty straightforward, right? 
Then there's another one that's for AWS credentials. So you can dynamically provision AWS credentials to do something and have those credentials set to expire after a certain amount of time. And when that time is up, Vault will reach out and remove those AWS credentials so they're no longer valid. So if you have some automated service that spins up and needs AWS credentials, it could hit Vault to get those credentials, and then those credentials could be discarded later. So that's another big aspect of it is once you have Vault set up, you get your authentications going and you get the secrets you want to use going. Then in order to determine what someone can do within Vault, you can create policies and policies are basically the ACLs of Vault. They determine who can do what where. So the who is a person or a machine. The what is what actions can they perform? Can they get secrets? Can they write secrets? Can they delete them? And the where is on what path can they do that? And policies answer all of those questions and they can get very, very granular. Now I was hoping to show the, the UI and the CLI of Vault, but we're already running a little bit long. So I will suffice to say, if you wanna get started, it's really easy to do. There's a dev instance of the server that you can spin up locally and mess around with. So you just go to vaultproject.io, download the version of Vault that works with your operating system, and then simply go to the command line and you'll do vault server dash dev and it'll spin up a dev instance. You can go, you can either interact with it through the CLI or open up a browser and go to localhost port 8200 and it'll be available on there and you'll need the root token which will show in the output when you start the dev server. So that's, it's so easy to get started if you just wanna mess around and try out some things, you won't break anything, it's just running as a dev instance. And hopefully that gives you a good conceptual overview of what exists in Vault. It's a lot of information to pack into 10 minutes. On the next episode, I think I will go through that process of setting up that basic dev server, and we're going to get into the first component of Vault, which is the authentication methods. So that will be the topic for next week's uh, Vault episode. So stay tuned for that. It'll be next Friday. That does it for me for the week. Thank you so much for watching. If you watch this week, I appreciate the support and the comments and, and everything else. Stay healthy and stay safe this weekend, and I'll see you again on Monday. Bye for now.